It's finally Halloween season, the time of year for pumpkins, costumes, and candy. It's also the time of year when ghosts and monsters take over our television screens to fill us with frights. But ghosts and monsters aren't just good for scares. As companies learned in the 1960s and 1970s, they could also be good for sales. It started when Universal released many of its classic horror films like Dracula, Frankenstein, The Mummy, and The Wolfman for television broadcast in 1957. Previously only available on the big screen, television introduced the classic monster movies to a whole new generation of children and teenagers who could watch from the relative comfort and safety of their living rooms. And they loved it. One of the first indicators that monsters would become a major trend was a magazine called Famous Monsters of Filmland. The magazine was created by James Warren, an advertiser from Philadelphia. He and editor Forrest J. Ackerman published Famous Monsters of Filmland in 1958. It was originally intended as a one-time project with articles like Monsters Are Good For You, The Frankenstein Story, and How Hollywood Creates a Monster. The magazine made its debut during what Warren called the worst blizzard in history. He thought for sure the project was doomed. Instead, all 200,000 copies sold out, and young readers demanded more. By 1964, Monsters of Filmland was a bi-monthly publication with a circulation of 124,000. The magazine spawned an empire of other monster and horror-related publications and would be formative for famous movie directors like Tim Burton and Steven Spielberg. Inspired by Warren and Ackerman's work, a toy company called Aurora Plastics began making monster model kits. Not unlike a model airplane, kids could take the kits home, assemble the pieces, and paint it. The end result was your very own Frankenstein, Dracula, or Wolfman. According to company president Abe Shikes, it was important that the monster models be recognizable. It has to be well known, a star. Because of this, Aurora had a royalty agreement with Universal, who owned the iconic image of many monsters from their classic horror movies. When Aurora introduced the Make Your Own Monster Kit, distributors were unimpressed. According to Look Magazine, their reaction ranged from apathy to downright mutiny. That was until the first shipment of Frankenstein and Dracula kits sold out in just one day. The kits were a hit, and Aurora sales jumped by $5 million the year they were introduced. Of course, the monster fad did not escape the attention of TV networks. They responded by airing new shows like The Munsters, The Addams Family, Sesame Street, Dark Shadows, and Jeepers Creepers. And Hollywood was churning out new horror flicks faster than could be counted. The trend also captured the interest of the press. The New York Times described the monster fad as, quote, almost but not quite as widespread as Beatlemania. Other newspapers joked that rock and roll was being replaced by shock and ghoul, or shock and ghoul rather. And Newsweek called preteens interested in horror creepy boppers, a play on the teeny boppers that had defined the rock and roll era of the 1950s. It seemed that everyone had their own theory for why monsters had suddenly captured the interest of children and teens. Some believed that monsters were relatable. Forrest Ackerman told Newsweek, Kids these days identify with monsters because the monsters were all victims of circumstance. Frankenstein, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, the Phantom of the Opera, even Dracula were all in worlds they did not control, much like kids when they're little. Others thought that the fascination with monsters was about overcoming fear. Dr. Zelda Wolp of the University of Southern California noted that watching monster movies could be healthy for kids. Horror films build up, then release tension, and this may help children to overcome real-life anxiety. Acclaimed sci-fi writer Ray Bradbury believed that the fantasy that comes out in Frankenstein or Dracula is our way of dealing with death. When you see Dracula, you watch the essence of death scaring you for 90 minutes. Then Dr. Van Helsing hands you a cedar steak, you go boom, you kill death, and your anxiety is allayed. For a while, at least. Kid fans themselves did not seem to find the monsters from the 1930s or 1940s to be terribly frightening. Nobody is really scared by the monsters. We know they're not real, a 12-year-old Frankenstein fan told the New York Times. And a young girl showed her monster collection to Look magazine. Look, we made them ourselves. Aren't they cute? 
Ultimately, the reason why kids liked monsters didn't really matter to companies. What mattered was that monsters were a big trend, and companies were eager to get on board. In 1971, General Mills introduced Count Chocula and Frankenberry, marshmallow cereals named after Count Dracula and Frankenstein, respectively. Ralston and Purina countered by offering their own monster-themed cereal, called Freakies. Bristol Myers made vitamins in scarumptious monster shapes and got the king of horror Vincent Price to market them in print ads and commercials. And that's just a few specific examples. There were monster masks, teeth, t-shirts, necklaces, and bracelets, monster puzzles and board games, monster cards and packages of bubblegum, and even monster bubble bath that promised to scare the dirt away. And you're probably familiar with at least one specific monster-themed song that came out of this time period. He did the monster mash. Even comic books, who had at first adhered to the rules of the Comic Code Authority, which forbade scenes dealing with, or instruments associated with, Walking Dead, torture, vampires, ghouls, cannibalism, and werewolfism, relented. By 1974, about one-third of Marvel's comics line of 84 magazines reportedly had monster-related content. The most popular at the time was reportedly Tomb of Dracula, which followed the King of Vampires and the monster hunters who sought to destroy him. Monsters had become big business, and not just at Halloween. Take this ad for Killer Diller Colors by Cutex, for example. Advertising lip and nail polishes in shades like Bewitch in Bronze and One Step Beyond Beige, Cutex paired its new colors with familiar monsters. As a side note, I didn't know what Killer Diller meant, but it's slang for someone or something especially talented or outstanding. This ad appeared in magazines targeted at teenage girls in March and April 1966. This ad for Smirnoff featured Frankenstein and appeared in March 1967. And Vincent Price's print ad for Monster Vitamins appeared in January and February 1975. Now, not everyone was thrilled with the monster fad. Aurora Plastics in particular caught the ire of parents for making monster models that included instruments of gruesome torture and death such as a swinging pendulum blade, a hanging cage, or a guillotine that actually cut off the head of a doll. But in general, the monsters that graced children's products seemed innocuous enough. As Louise Ames, co-director of the Giselle Institute of Child Development, told Forbes magazine, most children know that they're not really threatened by monsters, on TV or in books. And children's characters like Oscar the Grouch, Count Von Count, and Cookie Monster made monsters more lovable than scary. The monster fad largely peaked in 1964 and then again in the early 1970s, and many of the products that capitalized on the trend are now long gone. But Americans' love of horror and monsters certainly hasn't gone away. Highly successful novels, movies, television series, and toys like Interview with a Vampire, Twilight, The Walking Dead, Stranger Things, and Monster High are reflections of a continued interest and delight in the world of monsters. Many have argued that monsters are representations of our collective fears as a society. So as long as there are things to be afraid of, there will be monsters. And monsters will continue to be both popular and lucrative at Halloween and beyond. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this look back at the monster fad of the 1960s and 1970s. I was originally planning to do a whole video about the history of General Mills monster cereals, but while I was researching for that topic, I kind of stumbled into this topic instead, and I just thought it was really interesting. The thing that really sold it for me was actually the Vincent Price ad for Monster Vitamins. I mean, does it get any better than that? If you like this video and you would like to hear me talk about the history of other ordinary things and the cultural trends that influence them, please consider giving this video a like and subscribing to my channel below. Thank you again and I'll see you next time.